quote, pathic identification in populist movements, the specter of anti-Semitism in right and left protests, by Patrick Ahern. The murder of George Floyd by Minneapolis, Minneapolis police officers inspired one of the largest protest movements in U.S. history. Along with these protests came not only the calls for the end of state violence against people of color, but also a broader call to resist white supremacy and authoritarianism in favor of a more democratic order. Unfortunately, <coughs> amidst the enthusiasm of the protest, there also appeared a reemergence of anti-Semitic rhetoric in the terms of both, quote, coded forms of anti-Semitism and more explicit forms of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. The impetus to research the role of anti-Semitism in left and right protest groups emerged out of the rise in violence and rhetoric from right-wing extremist groups, and also from the rise in anti-Semitic rhetoric and an ostensibly anti-racist movement on the left. On, at the height of the protests in the summer of 2020, former National Basketball Association star and close friend of George Floyd, Stephen Jackson, became an outspoken voice against r the racial violence and inequality that created the conditions that led to the murder of his friend. Unfortunately, in the midst of this spirit of justified outrage, while defending professional football player Deshaun Jackson's fake Hitler quote in an Instagram post, Stephen Jackson turned to comment anti-Semitic conspiratorial tropes, stating, quote, You know who the Rothschilds are. They own all the banks, end quote, exclaiming, quote, I haven't said one thing that is untrue, end quote. What was alarming was not necessarily that Jackson would make such a claim, but rather the reaction by many supposed advocates for racial justice who responded by lauding Jackson for, quote, speaking truths, or more commonly with silence. Footnote, a notable exception was the initial pushback that he received from Mark Shepard, a 19-year-old described as a, quote, se seasoned anti-Semitism combat artist, end quote, who confronted Jackson in exchange on Jackson's Instagram live feed. End footnote. In the following week in June of 2020, he spoke in Kalamazoo, Michigan, a town that had recently suffered a spate of instances of police violence against protesters. Footnote. Kalamazoo was also the site of a Proud Boys rally in August of 2020, marked by inadequate response by public safety to prevent the rally for rally, excuse me, prevent the rally from devolving into street violence. End footnote. It was striking that the organizers of the public speaking engagement decided to remain silent in the face of such anti-Semitic comments that would seem to not have any place in promoting solidarity in the fight against for excuse me in the fight for racial justice. Unfortunately, this was not an isolated event, and there is a long history of quote left wing anti Semitism that seems to feed into an uncritical form of populist unity, even if many of the expressions are not as explicit as the words of Mr. Jackson, Jackson and certainly not as explicit or vitriolic of the anti Semitic rhetoric and violence that is encountered in right wing populist protest. It does open up the question of how a self-reflexive and critical form of solidarity, resistance to the allure of conspiracies and hateful antagonism could be fostered in the fight against racism and undemocratic forces. The deployment of anti-Semitism expressed in self-contradictory yet persistent ways has found a place within the political rhetoric of the quote agitators of the right for generations. The anti-Semitism of the right is a more visceral and aggressive expression of hatred, promoting an atmosphere in which conspiracy, stereotypes, and resentment are realized in actual violence against Jewish people, contemporary harangues against, quote, Hollywood, and a so-called cabal of, quote, elites or, quote, intellectuals can trace their roots to the agitators of previous generations to devastating effect. While cognitively incoherent, the appeal and repetition of political agitators necessitates psychological, social, and political analyses. Rather than providing the psychological, social, and political outlets to transform the causes of a disaffected populace's resentment 
in the direction of emancipation, the agitator offers up conspiratorial stereotypes, redirecting the individual's rage against the objective conditions toward the supposed embodiment of this frustration in the, quote, Jew. The consequence of this redirection of resentment becomes actual violence and rage against Jewish people. One of the key challenges to those committed to the values of the fundamental principles of human rights in the current socio-political climate comes from the appeal to forms of populism that are often resistant to critical self-reflection and quite often are authoritarian in nature and harbingers to hate and violence. It follows that any critical resistance to racist and undemocratic impulses must understand the psychological, social, and political conditions that promote as well as the mechanisms that activate the appeal of right-wing anti-Semitism as well as other forms of hatred based in social identifications. For those involved in activism or advocacy in opposition to these undemocratic forces, there must be a mode of self-reflection that does not respond to one delusional and pathic identification with another. Beyond looking to resources for understanding the appeal of anti-Semitism in populist movements, the question that I wish to pose is, what might it take to develop a critical form of solidarity that does not carry along the baggage of self-defeating, quote, pathic forms of identification? Footnote. The use of the term, quote, pathic is following its use in Theodore Adorno's lecture titled, quote, Aspects of the New Right-Wing Extremism, end footnote. Contextualizing the Rise of Populism The polarization of politics, not only in the United States, but not notably in many places in South America, Europe, and Asia, has precipitated the concerns that come with the proliferation of antagonistic and fractured political rhetoric and also the emergence of a new brand of undemocratic authoritarian elements moving into the mainstream of political discourse and activity. The well-founded critiques of the limitations of democratic self-determination in liberal democracies, let alone neoliberal frameworks, have provided ample evidence of the failure of so-called democracies to live up to their promises, inheritors of the French Revolution, for liberty, equality, and fraternity. So, I mean, for liberty, equality, or fraternity. Political participation in the neoliberal context has to be modeled after the economic marketplace, where political parties modeled themselves after God, excuse me, after goods in the market. Appealing to the real or imagined interest of the populace while serving the bottom line in the hierarchical economic system. The consequences of this transformation can be felt in the increased concentration of capital, ultimately opening the space for the increase in authoritarianism, whether that authoritarianism expressed in professedly democratic or undemocratic frameworks. In his reflections on right-wing extremism presented in 1967, but perhaps even more relevant today, Theodore Adorno invites the dangers of the objective conditions in which we live today when he wrote that, quote, the conditions for fascist movements are still socially, if not politically, present. Here I am thinking especially of the still prevailing tendency towards concentration of capital, end quote. While the concentration of capital has escalated, what appears to be the most alarming and demanding of an urgent response is that the political conditions would seem to be more and not less susceptible to authoritarianism than when Adorno was writing in the post-war years. The rise of neoliberal expressions of authority has revealed a weakened and vulnerable mood of model of democracy that appears to be moving towards an ever more troubling state of affairs, which increased polarization and the rise of populism. Populist movements have arisen from both corners of the political spectrum, but what populist movements share is a general outlook towards politics that assumes that the possibility for democratic deliberation is past. Mm -hmm. Rather than a competition of political views, interests, and policies, politics is seen as a battle between forces that are reduced to, quote, us versus them, good versus evil, the, quote, people versus the, quote, elites. In describing this phenomenon, Samir Gandesha, in 2018, contrasts parliamentary democracy with populist politics when he writes, quote, indeed, in place of parliamentarianism, debate and discussion and compromise between opposed parties and groups, populism suggests that politics hinges on the existential mm -hmm. confrontation between, quote, the people and the, quote, elite or the, quote, powerful, 
The rise of populist movements and populism is not a monolith, and it can not, not, and it can clearly be debated whether or not there can be emancipatory populist movements. For example, it can in some instances be argued that populist movements have perhaps widened political discourse in calling for political responses to the needs of the masses concerning issues such as epidemic levels of opioid abuse, health care, child care, and poverty. However, such political conditions, especially when accompanied by the social and economic conditions created by the increased concentration of capital, provides a fertile ground for the manipulation of the masses and the expansion of authoritarianism and social division, which finds manifestation in, among other ways, the rise of anti-Semitism within these populist movements. Pathic Identification and Right-Wing Antisemitism In attempting to understand the attraction of right-wing extremism, it is striking how the work of the early Frankfurt School writers on extremism and antisemitism resonates for contemporary observers. In the section of Dialectic of Enlightenment titled, quote, Elements of Antisemitism, Limits of Enlightenment, Horkheimer and Adorno identify many of the ways antisemitism serves the interests of the ruling class when they wrote that, quote, bourgeois antisemitism has a specific economic purpose to conceal domination in production, end quote. This iteration of the purpose of anti-Semitism is helpful for understanding how anti-Semitism can serve those in power, but alone it does not provide the observer with a better understanding of how right-wing, quote, agitators find a broader appeal and following. To understand this appeal, one must look to what the ad adherent supposedly, quote, gains from I such ideology and what are the mechanisms used by right-wing agitators. <clears throat> In their text, The Prophets of Deceit, released in abridged form in English as False Prophets, Studies and Authoritarianism, Communication in Society, Volume 3, Leo Leuventhal and Norbert Gutterman, contrast the right-wing, quote, agitator from reformers or revolutionaries of various stripes. Unlike the traditional activist, the agitator appeals to the agitator's audience without either looking to the socioeconomic structures or political reflections that are the source of their frustration are providing a vision of emancipation from real-world problems. Quote, the reformer or revolutionary concentrates on an analysis of the situation and tends to ignore irrational or subconscious elements, end quote, they write. Quote, but the agitator appeals primarily to irrational or subconscious elements at the expense of the rational and analytical, end quote, rather than mediating, on, mediating an analysis of a social form such as capitalism for the socialist, the agitator proceeds by appealing to a world that is hopelessly rigged by mysterious forces beyond their control in the press, culture, and science. This opens up an apocalyptic vision that does not offer respite to the weary. Ambiguous references to conspiracy prevent the possibility for embarking upon a rational analysis of the objective conditions that are the source of their frustration. Leuventhal and Gutterman observe that Quote, the agitator proceeds in exactly the opposite way. The agitator refers to popular stereotypes only to encourage vague resentments they reflect, dot, dot, dot. On a social scale, the agitator stirs reactions similar to those of paranoia on an individual scale, and the agitator's means of doing this is by indefinitely extending the concept of conspiracy, end quote. Rather than providing an outlet for a greater understanding, the agitator, quote, cheats them out of their curiosity, end quote, yeah, excuse me, cheats them out of their curiosity, cheats them of their curiosity, end quote. Rather than providing constructive models for emancipation, the agitator plays upon the satisfaction of unconscious and infantile desires. There was a footnote that I missed here. Referenced by right-wing politicians and media in the United States of, quote, deep state conspiracies draw upon such well-worn tropes of conspiratorial bureaucracy.
End footnote. What then is offered by the crude nature of right-wing anti-Semitism and rhetoric, even if coded in terms that avoid using explicitly racial terms, such as, quote, elites, quote, Hollywood, or, quote, intellectuals? Since it is not emancipation from difficulties and frustrations being offered, then the source of satisfaction cannot be strictly understood political in nature. Leuventhal and Gutterman diagnosed the situation as one that exacerbates unconscious impulses rather than working through frustrations to constructive ends, in what they term quite, psych, quote, psychoanalysis in reverse, end quote. Leuventhal and Gutterman write, quote, it may be conjectured that by his reference to rape, incest, and plunder, the agitator evokes sadistic fantasies that add a connotation of promise to the warning. His followers may vaguely hope that when the deluge comes, they too may be allowed to perform the acts that are attributed to the enemy, end quote. What is offered then is the satisfaction of unconscious and infantile desires for destruction. Two footnotes here. First footnote, one can find echoes of this rhetoric in Donald Trump's discussions of immigrants as well. End footnote. Next footnote, one can see the irrationality and infantile rage in practice when considering the role that various symbols play for right-wing groups, whereas any perceived slight to the symbol, such as national flags, calls for ruthless, unmediated rage. It is unsurprising to find the importance of image boards and memes to spread their message. As Adorno remarked, quote, so the unconscious tendencies that feed the authority-bound personality are not brought to light by this propaganda. On the contrary, they are forced even deeper into the unconscious. Consider the excessive significance of so-called symbols that characterizes all these movements, end quote. End footnote. Since understanding of or escape from the conspiratorial condition is hopeless, all that is left is the apocalyptic vision of destruction and the enticement of the satisfaction of sadistic, unconscious desires. The unique position of anti-Semitic elements in right-wing agitation draws upon well-worn stereotypes and tropes that are cognitively coherent and able to maintain the flexibility to insert, quote, the Jew as the source of danger and derision. Some of the most iconic images of recent right-wing activism have included the images of the, quote, Jews as vying for world domination, as when the tiki torch-wielding crowds in Charlottesville shouted, quote, the Jews will not replace us. And that of the dominated and helpless is exemplified by the famous image of the 6th January insurrectionists wearing a, quote, Camp Auschwitz t-shirt. Quote, the Jew who cannot get in line with the, quote, pathic nationalism of the audience becomes an object of resentment and ultimately violent expressions of rage. The right-wing agitator, quote, transforms the stereotypes into a logically self-contradictory but psychologically consistent image of the Jews who appear both weak and strong, victim of persecution and persecutor, endowed with unchangeable racial characteristics and irrepressible individualism, end quote. Leuventhal and Gutterman. The fungibility for the Jew to provide a source of derision that undercuts the capacity for self-reflection becomes manifested as the enemy on all sides, whether that is in the form of the free-thinking and unrepressed individual or the powerless victim. The image of the Jew as the, quote, communist banker epitomizes the fantastical nature of the role the, quote, Jew plays in right-wing ideology, for, quote, the Jew represents both the dark cloud of state-centered communism and the, quote, bad capitalist who engages in usury. To be sure, this leaves little room for rational reflection and the depths of the pathological identification of quote nation and quote race may not allow for breaking free from the ideological force of such prejudices. 
However, as such identifications have moved from the so-called lunatic fringe towards the center of mainstream political discourse, and since resignation is not an option, one is compelled to look to what is required in response to such delusions and prejudices, namely independent thought. In Dialectic of Enlightenment, Horkheimer and Adorno speak to this aspiration in writing, quote, Only the liberation of thought from power, the abolition of violence, could realize the idea which has been unrealized until now, that the Jew is a human being, end quote. The, quote, split in people's consciousness, end quote, where they are able to see concrete benefits to themselves despite their pathological identifications with right-wing populist movements, such as can be seen in recent resistance to the dissolution of the, quote, Affordable Care Act, or in response to the opioid crisis, provides some insight into the possibility that despite the irrationality of beliefs and rhetoric, there is a space in which rational reflection of concrete interests can take hold. Anti-Semitism and the Left Anti-Semitism on the left, while sharing some features of the conspiratorial satisfactions of the right, traditionally does not have the same visceral maliciousness as that found in right-wing anti-Semitism. However, if the left is understood, unlike the right-wing agitator, to be providing an account of the objective social, economic, and political conditions that prevent emancipation, as well as political models of emancipation that follow from the values of the French Revolution, then any model of solidarity in favor of democratic principles would have to resist the urge to dichotomous and prejudiced thinking that has infiltrated populist movements on the left as well. The appeal of anti-Semitism on the left takes various forms, but these forms of anti-Semitism are also driven, especially in their conspiratorial form, to, the bl to blind the advocate from confronting the complexities of social political, economic, and even national power. I will briefly look to the historical nature of left anti-Semitism that arises in both socialist and liberalist traditions in the form of the, quote, Jewish question, when then I will look to ro the role of anti-Semitic conspiracies and the debate surrounding discussions of Israel and Zionism before turning to the implicated relation of black and Jewish emancipation. The so-called Jewish question arose within the context of the Enlightenment and the values of the French Revolution that inaugurated a call for, quote, universal human rights, albeit in the context of the early forms of the modern nation-state, quote, the Jew served as the fundamental other of national identity on the one hand, and contradictorily the rootless cosmopolitan who was perceived as not, quote, earning the right to have rights. Robert Fine and Philip Spencer, who I have uh, worked from both of these authors on the channel, sum up the origins of the modern, quote, Jewish question when they write that, quote, one of the peculiarities of the, quote, anti-Judaic tradition has been to represent Jews in some important regard as, quote, other of the universal, as the personification either of a particularism opposed to the universal or of a false universalism concealing Jewish self-interest. The former contrasts the particularism of the Jews to the universality of bourgeois civil society. The latter contrasts the bad universalism of the, quote, rootless cosmopolitan Jew, end quote, to the good universalism of whatever universal is advanced, be it nation, race, or the class, end quote. Robert Fine and Philip Spencer.
Marx famously addressed the, quote, Jewish question in his rejection of Bruno Bauer's claims that Jews should be excluded from having rights. The nuance of Marx's writings in this essay, as well as on other treatments of the topic, is often misunderstood in terms of both his critique of, quote, bourgeois manifestations of human rights and his rejection of anti-Semitic arguments in liberal and socialist circles that sought to exclude Jewish emancipation from the scope of human emancipation. The tradition of left anti-Semitism purports to view the Jew as the enemy of the values of liberty, equality, and fraternity while undermining the very revolutionary force of such a call. The criticism of, quote, bourgeois rights given in Marx's essay is not that these values should be abandoned, but rather that their manifestations within the confines of capitalist power are self-defeating preventing human emancipation that would provide for liberty or equality, let alone fraternity. The premise of these images of, quote, the Jew, while coded in contrast to the overt anti-Semitism of the right, still preys upon the conspiratorial ideologies that prevent a critical reflection of the objective conditions that undermine emancipation. Marcel Stutzler succinctly diagnoses the self-defeating nature of left anti-Semitism when he writes, quote, By far the most instances of what is commonly perceived to be, quote, anti-Semitic anti-capitalism is not anti-capitalism at all, but rather the anti-Semitic version of the conservative reformist search for a way of politically framing capitalism that does not threaten pre-existing social hierarchies of power, including those of nation, race, caste, creed, sex, and sexuality, end quote. The moral repugnancy of anti-Semitism should go without saying, but when one looks closer at the manifestations of anti-Semitism on the left, it becomes evident that it entails a turning away from rational analysis and reflection regarding objective conditions, and, to the, that extent and more, from the promise of human rights and human emancipation. The tenor of anti-Zionism on the left is most of all filtered through the lens of anti-Zionist and anti-Israel rhetoric. The complexities and historical forces at work in the tensions and violence in the Middle East lend themselves to reductive understandings. In some sense, this is understandable since it is so difficult, especially for those who are not immersed in the multiplicity of forces and interests at stake. To be sure, the state of Israel has perpetrated excessive violence against its neighbors, maintaining Ill an illegal occupation of Palestinian lands that led to continuous violations of international human rights law and organized a society based in institutionally discriminatory practices. A commitment to the value of human rights would compel any observer to critique and call for a change to these objective conditions. There is, however, a uniqueness to the tenor of the criticisms of Israel on the left that have that rather than looking at the Israeli civil and political society in its complexity, addresses Israel as if Israel were a reified, homogenous, and immutable entity in ways that are not reserved for the crimes and failures of other nations. The fervor against an individual nation and not an individual leader, party, etc. borders upon the sort of unreflective rage that is usually the signature of the worldview presented by, quote, pathic nationalists. Rather than analyzing what is unjust and undemocratic in Israeli society in order to resist these forces continuing to perpetrate actual injustice, there is often a quick turn to the notion of Zionist global conspiracies and at times a call to wipe out the Jews. Rather than promoting justice and calling those responsible to task, such approaches are blinding and self-defeating in the pursuit of a peaceful and just Middle East. Since I began this reflection on the infiltration of anti-Semitic views within the context of the Black Lives Matter protest, I think it is important to note the complex relations historically and socially between Jews and African Americans. It's beyond the scope of this essay to provide a detailed history of this relation, but I think it is worth pointing out that often this relation has been both fraught by the underlying injustices within American society and enhanced by a shared commitment to emancipation, as evidenced by the relatively considerable number of Jewish contributors to the struggle for African American civil rights. <laughs> 
However, the wounds of a society fractured by racial injustice have had also had understandable consequences in fomenting tension. James Baldwin, when reflecting upon his community's ambivalent relation to Jewish people, writes, quote, In the American context, the most ironical thing about Negro anti-Semitism is that the Negro is really condemning the Jew for having become an American white man, for having become, in effect, a Christian. The Jew profits from his status in America, and he must expect Negroes to distrust him for it. The Jew does not realize that the credential he offers, the fact that he has been despised and slaughtered, does not increase the Negro's understanding. It increases the Negro's rage, end quote. Baldwin here identifies not only the feelings of rage or resentment, but importantly reflects upon the causes of this rage. Rather than turning away from the social, historical, and political conditions out of which this rage emerges, Baldwin provides a critical perspective that self-reflectively looks to the sources of rage and outwardly tor turns towards its causes. He is identifying the source of frustration in the white power structure in the United States, causing resentment against those who benefit from this structure, including Jews. Baldwin directs his frustration towards the socioeconomic conditions that allow for greater opportunities for white Americans as a source of this frustration. Baldwin's analysis stands in stark contrast to the political agitator who harnesses the rage and directs the rage outwardly in hate and violence that leaves the unjust structures that are the source of this rage untouched by critique. Unlike right-wing agitation or conspiratorial ideological thinking of right and left, such critical reflections open the possibility of emancipation that would otherwise be stifled. Critical Solidarity The challenge of developing critical solidarity is central to the possibility of fighting against oppressive and violent hierarchies of race, gender, sexuality, and class, as well as imperialistic and militaristic forces that are mobilized in preserving or deepening the divides within the status quo. There is an unmistakable appeal in providing simple, satisfying responses to complex problems, especially those that overwhelm the subject. Pathological conditions reach the point of no return at the moment when prejudice blocks the capacity for experience and thus reflection. Anti-Semitic conspiracies are a product of pathological states and only serve to deepen those pathological conditions. As historical evidence shows, such responses lead to the outward and self-defeating expressions of rage and violence. The challenge is, of course, to develop a more robust model of solidarity. At the very least, the recurrence of anti-Semitic rhetoric, often at the most urgent moment of political action, calls for strenuous resistance and self-reflection for those committed to a more just and humane world. The affective pool of the divisive rhetoric of left populism carries with it the danger of cutting off, off the possibility of developing critical solidarity, carrying with it the perils of unreflective identification and what Horkheimer and Adorno referred to as, quote, ticket thinking. Horkheimer and Adorno correctly warn that the dangers of the irrational mob lurk in supposedly progressive circles as well as in right-wing protest if the need for critique and self-reflection is not persistently fostered. They write, quote, To be sure, the psychologically more humane are attracted to freedom, but the advancing loss of experience is finally turning even the supporters of the progressive ticket into enemies of difference, it is not just the anti-Semitic ticket which is anti-Semitic, but the ticket mentality itself, end quote. Critical solidarity can only be developed out of a resistance to all forms of irrational affects of hate and from an affirmative and self-reflective coordination that allows for difference and dissent. For when cohesion is formed only insofar as passions are stirred, there is only a mob and not a mass movement. As Spinoza points out, quote, insofar as men are subject to passions, men cannot be said to agree in nature, dot, 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 for things that agree only in negation or in what they do not have really agree in nothing, end quote. In other words, the mobilization of mobs by means of directing rage towards prejudicial hate cuts off the possibility for developing critical solidarity. <clears throat> 
This critical solidarity is required for a social movement that aims towards emancipation. Following Spinoza's insight, solidarity can only properly be developed through the shared power to act and not through the release of rage through prejudicial hate. The source of critical solidarity can only be developed with any shared commitment to a justice and dialogical framework of self-reflection and contestation regarding means and in some cases even ends. There must be a resistance to constructing a false solidarity that comes with models of communitarianism formed out of the, quote, pathic connections to in-groups and out-groups, but is rather built upon the understanding that the strength of a movement arises from that movement's capacity to incorporate and sustain difference while pursuing a cosmopolitan notion of solidarity. Footnote. Fuyuki Kurosawa provides an analysis of the various models of solidarity that range from the, quote, false forms of provincial solidarity to cosmopolitanism in his text, The Work of Global Justice, Human Rights as Practices, and footnote. The universalism promoted by such a critical solidarity can come not from an assumption of sameness, but from the commitment to a model of emancipation that not only allows for difference, but also takes as its strength the capacity for rational self-reflection that can come with the incorporation of diverse perspectives. Along with the recognition that identifications that divide according to nationality, race, gender, and so on create an impediment to the pursuit of a more just world, comes the understanding that exclusionary identifications, such as those proposed by the anti-Semite, leave the concrete structures of oppression in place. The call for a critical solidarity that rejects such, quote, pathic models of identification is not only a moral injunction. Rather, it is a call that emerges out of a rational reflection upon the structures and causes preventing a just world, as well as the practical needs for the realization of social transformation towards collective emancipation. The development of critical solidarity calls for the rejection of the definition of interest in terms of either liberal individualism or collectivist models. The atomistic model of interest prevents the possibility of solidarity and at worst provides ample grounds for authoritarian tendencies to flourish as seen in recent right-wing protests. Collectivist models that view solidarity as arising from similitude can ultimately only reinforce the structures of oppression by turning away from social and economic causes in favor of affective and even infantile satisfactions and pathic identifications. Solidarity cannot be bound to the premise of, quote, in or, quote, out group that demand assimilation from their allies. The lessons and dangers that accompany the assimilationist model have long been evident to observers of and activists engaged in movements for emancipation. W.E.B. Du Bois came to this realization in writing that the African-American engaged in the struggle for freedom, quote, began to have a dim feeling that to attain his place in the world, he must be himself and not another, end quote. Assimilationist compulsions or exclusions based on ideological constructs such as those found in the, quote, Jewish question, where Jews were excluded from universal rights because they were seen as particular or external to the false universality of the Enlightenment, only offer the promise of group identification that will conflict with the aims of emancipation. In other words, critical solidarity calls for a dialectical coordination in which difference is not subsumed in identity. The rise of right-wing authoritarian populism comes with the alarming threat of violence and the breakdown of even formal democratic structures. These conditions present a real danger for violence and the dissolution of even the nominal preservation, let alone the advancement of human rights. The false belief that the resonance of such authoritarian populism was restricted to a fringe group of, quote, deplorables, as Hillary Clinton famously referred to this movement, only serves the self-gratification of those hoping to maintain an untenable status quo.
Since those words about the, quote, deplorables were uttered, the real breadth of the appeal of authoritarian variants of populism in the United States has become undeniable. In the period after the Second World War, when the fascist movements were far less mainstream or at least pushed underground, Adorno referred to these movements, quote, as the wounds, the scars of a democracy that to this day has not yet lived up to its own concept, end quote. If one is to accept this premise, premise regarding the objective conditions that promote the rise of collective irrationalism in the form of populist rage, the resistance to this phenomenon would not be served either by name-calling or by reassuring oneself that its appeal is limited to some fringe element in society. Resistance to this phenomenon can only come with careful and sustained analyses of the social, historical, economic, and political causes that create the political arena of a mob mentality that infiltrates not only right-wing but also left-wing populism. Whether it is possible for a left-wing populism to advance rigorously democratic principles is murky at best, but any movement that is weighed down by exclusionary ways of thinking such as misogyny, racism, nationalism, and indeed anti-Semitism abdicates the capacity for transformation from the status quo to a more democratic and humane world. It should be noted that this entails not drawing divergent perspectives, quote, into line, but rather developing a model of critical solidarity that is structured around rational reflection and democratic principles of unity and difference. <clears throat> 